All right, hello everybody. We're we're gonna get started. Um, I can't tell. It's, I'm not gonna put that. <laughs> Let's not break it. Well, thank you everybody for coming today, and thank you for everybody who's online. Um, just a few sort of bookkeeping things, um, so that everybody's aware, and then we'll, we'll do an introduction. We'll get started. So uh, today's lecture is sponsored by the National Institute for Transportation and Communities. U of A is currently a partner institution. Um, this is the second of three lectures that we're holding this term. So we hope that you enjoy it. And we hope that you join us on April 21st for Lynn Peterson, who's gonna talk about uh, roadways for people um, and a book that she recently wrote. Um, this event is also co-hosted by the School of Landscape Architecture Lecture Series and CAEM, uh, Civil Engineering um, Lecture Series. So we have a blend of uh, planners and landscape architects and engineers here, as well as a, a, we invited all everybody from campus and practitioners. We certainly have a mix. Um, we are hosting this hybrid. So we have um, some people online that will be probably some more that will be joining us and people in person. So at the end of the lecture, Ethan, in person is going to be navigating and moderating the discussion. So we'll kind of alternate between um, in-person and online questions um, until about 1 p.m. And then as after that, I hope that you all join us at the Underwood Garden, whether or not you're online, if you're on campus at all, we'll have sandwiches and chips and stuff like that in the garden afterwards. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce you to um, Jesus Barajas from University of California, Davis in the department, which I think is called Environmental Science and Policy. Yes. Oh, ha. Um, been saying it wrong all day today. Um, <laughs> uh, he's joining us to talk about um, incorporating equity into transportation project evaluation, um, but he has a wide variety of studies and work uh, looking at uh, travel behavior, dispar disparities in travel behavior, um, outcomes and policy. Um, so we hope that you enjoy the talk. And with that, I will let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Christy. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm glad the rain stopped and I'm glad it's not too hot yet. All right, so I want to um, share some work that I've been doing around um, understanding how equity makes its way into practice um, at different scales of transportation planning and policy making, regional and state level, because things are done a little bit differently, but there are lots of similarities between the two. Um, and the different groups are sort of uh, in different stages of where they are in terms of incorporating equity into their work. So um, I would say sort of right now is an opportunity to, to um, really invest in some equity forward projects. Uh, federal guidance, particularly under this administration, uh, has been really um, centering equity in, in all of the, the work and investments that they're doing. So uh, the first executive order that came out of the administration, 13985, directed the federal government to, uh, including the US Department of Transportation to advance equity for historically marginalized population groups, uh, including identifying equity analysis um, methods, uh, conducting equity assessments and agencies, allocating resources for advancing equity and engaging with underserved populations. USDOT recently released a strategic action plan that outlines the focus areas of, for the department. One of those includes developing a transportation cost burden tool that supports the identification of, of inequities in, in access and mobility. The Justice 40 initiative, uh, which is has a lot of um, discussion right now, requires the federal government to spend at least 40% of its resources on clean energy investments in disadvantaged communities. And that of course has implications for transportation investment tool uh, as well. Um, this is an image here from the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, which is one of the tools that are used to help identify those communities that are the targets of those 40% of investments. Um, and we've had this uh, recent, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which contains, um, oops, 
contains billions of dollars for um, projects that could be focused on uh, equity uh, serving investments. So things like um, transit investment, um, port modernization. So thinking about sort of the EJ environmental justice implications of ports, um, EV charging infrastructure in disadvantaged communities, uh, rural access programs and reconnecting communities, which is a program to, that um, allows cities to, to start to undo the harm that highway infrastructure has done to disconnect um, many communities. So these, all of these programs and all of these initiatives sort of respond to equity focused needs, but as I'll share a little bit more uh, in, the, in the talk, um, there are some challenges, particularly at the state level for uh, departments of transportation who don't have much experience or training in thinking and incorporating equity uh, in the work that they do or um, may not have that as a priority initiative for, for their department. Um, Different states are treating this differently. California has a has an office of, of race and equity in the State Department of Transportation, um, which is, I would say, uh, unique among state DOTs. So um, there are a number of challenges with incorporating equity principles into um, into transportation planning and, and programming and policy making. Uh, the sort of life cycle of transportation planning here I have on the, on the right, and there's a number of different phases in which um, transportation equity analysis can occur, and those don't always speak to one another. Um, broader equity analysis is, I would say, relatively new to state departments of transportation. Um, but states have been required to conduct things like environmental impact assessments, environmental reviews, um, socio-cultural impact assessments under the uh, NEPA requirements, National Environmental Protection Act. Um, and this has been required for, uh, let's say, three decades or so since the Environmental Justice Executive Order. Uh, and they have different methods for, for how they're uh, implemented at these different stages. So uh, in some ways, they can come in conflict with one another. Uh, staff who may be familiar with how to do it in one area may not know how to do it in other areas. Uh, few departments of transportation have formalized policies and performance-based processes for ev in evaluating environmental justice and uh, equity. Um, they, there are some requirements for detailing outreach to underserved communities for incorporation in the in the planning process, but um, those details are not specific for how DOTs are required to do it, which means there's a lot of latitude for how uh, transportation agencies are accounting for how they're engaging the public uh, in their in their decision making processes for incorporating feedback. Um, there are uh, institutional and cultural barriers at departments of transportation and transportation, uh, other transportation planning agencies that have limited the effectiveness of uh, approaches to implementing equity. Um, one of those is the, continue, the continued priority on highway investment. So uh, for example, even though my home state, California, has a multimodal Department of Transportation, and they like to um, sort of emphasize their multimodality. Uh, still, somewhere of seventy, somewhere near seventy to eighty percent of their money is getting spent on highways. So there's still um, this this major emphasis on highway infrastructure, on road infrastructure that doesn't always meet multimodal needs, uh, particularly when we're thinking about disadvantaged populations. I would say that when we're thinking about sort of the scale of of, um, of governance with and policy making with respect to transportation. Um, here, I'm only talking about states and regions. Um, regions, metropolitan planning organizations have been at the forefront of, um, of developing equity-based tools and analysis and incorporating into their uh, planning and programming. Uh, but MPOs, they don't control a lot of money. They control the planning processes and they sort of 
uh, direct regions how they how they should be doing their investments. But again, the state is spending a lot of money on um, highway building. So when we think about the relative effects of these uh, of these plans, um, those the state is still going to trump uh, the region. So um, what I wanted to do is dig a little bit deeper into how these um, how all of this is sort of done. So understanding the landscape of how uh, equity is embedded into practice. And the research that I'm sharing today comes from primarily from, from two studies, but I, I have a third that's related that looks at the policies and practices of MPOs and state departments of transportation in multiple phases of the transportation planning process. So these three studies work together to illustrate um, some of the practices and some of the challenges in implementing equity and and planning and programming. So I'm gonna focus on um, these two here with a little bit of the, the work on community impact assessment sprinkled in uh, throughout the talk. So as I've been talking about these, um, these reports and, and this research really covers multiple phases in the transportation planning process. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, this one down here. Uh, project programming and uh, the transportation improvement program or the list of projects that MPOs uh, uh, make every three years or so that uh, show where they're committing the money, uh, where the region's projects are, uh, the money is committed to. Uh, so for this first project, the, the core question that we're asking is how MPOs use equity criteria in project prioritization, and planning, and programming. So for those less familiar, the, the region is required to um, continually develop these transportation improvement programs, roughly three-year cycles. They have to be consistent with their long-term plans. Uh, but these are the projects that are actually going to get funded and eventually uh, implemented maybe in the short-term cycle, maybe long-term, but there are plans for, for implementing this. So what we did is we, we took, um, I worked with my graduate student when I was at the University of Illinois at the time, um, uh, and the Metropolitan Planning uh, Council, which is a nonprofit uh, think tank kind of organization that does policy work in the Chicago region and has done some, some work in understanding and advocating for um, equity-based um, planning in the, in the region. So we looked at the 40 largest MPOs in the country. We looked at the documents they produce um, that tell what, what projects they're going to implement. So we looked at the long range transportation plans. We looked at the tips. We looked at project evaluation frameworks. We looked at um, policies for, uh, for managing an MPO's attributable funds that may not be in those documents. Um, evaluation guidelines for calls for proposals, um, anything in allocating funding from other sources like the state transportation block grant program, uh, the congestion management air quality program, transportation alternative programs, anything that said how they were going to make decisions about allocating funding for transportation. Uh, of those 40 MPOs, we were able to find documents for 34 of them. So six of them had nothing available for us to look at. And then of those 34, uh, four didn't have any prioritization criteria at all. They sort of met as um, with the region stakeholders and they did some deliberative process in there that was probably involving some, some horse trading for, uh, for this project, for that project, or that. But uh, we're not fully transparent about how those decisions were made. Um, so we had 30 uh, to look at. And then of those 30, 24 of them had some sort of equity criteria in how they were um, in their project methodologies, their project prioritization methodologies. We took those 24 and then we categorized the criteria and evaluated um, how they were used in their prioritization processes uh, and tried to look at how they fit in with other um, priorities as well, things like congestion management or safety, um, other uh, categories of, of areas that MPOs might use to make decisions for priorities. 
So this is what we came up with. Um, we evaluated those equity criteria based on um, how, how they defined the distribution of benefits and burdens of transportation along various uh, groups that differed by race, income, and ability. Uh, on uh, protecting and increasing benefits um, with an emphasis on looking at access to destinations, um, how they allocated resources based on community needs with an emphasis on restorative justice or, uh, or correcting past harms, and then um, how well they provided effective opportunities to participate in transportation decisions. So we ended up with this sort of typology of, of five categories um, that we qualitatively um, uh, assessed as increasing potential equity impact as you go from the left to the right of this diagram, and then one cross-cutting category at the bottom uh, for community engagement. So let me just explain these definitions uh, briefly. The first uh, location burdens base, which you see two MPOs here, um, would award points to projects if they were not located in communities of concern. So however they define a community of concern, maybe it was based on um, the share of people of color in the neighborhood, maybe it was based on poverty, um, maybe it was some index of a combination of multiple transportation disadvantages. Uh, but this was focused on uh, awarding points if the, the, uh, the project was not located in those, those neighborhoods or if projects were implemented and there were explicit measures to mitigate harm from those projects. The second category and the most common category we called location benefits based. So they awarded projects, points if projects were in those neighborhoods. Um, they, these don't explicitly consider the kinds of impacts from the projects, they just consider whether or not that the project is located in the neighborhood. I'll give some examples of these uh, in a moment here. Uh, the next most common was this uh, impact space category. So those evaluated the potential benefits and burdens. So maybe things like uh, safety improvements, um, congestion reduction, air quality improvements, things like that, and awarded more points for greater impact and less points for, for fewer impact. Um, again, if they're located in communities of concern. Uh, we had five MPOs that, um, that issued criteria based on access to destinations. So um, these are both measures of impact, but five of them explicitly focused on the question of access, how much stuff you could get to um, and how easy it was to get there. Uh, these are all sort of looking at community or neighborhood um, as the unit of analysis for which they're sort of evaluating impact or location. But three MPOs actually um, assessed the who would be the users of the, the project of the transportation facility if that was the, the project. And so that looked at um, whether people, whether the investment would benefit uh, users who are historically marginalized in the in the process, in the transportation planning process. Uh, and then we had this, this cross-cutting category um, that sort of looks at process for um, developing projects rather than sort of the outcomes or, or impacts. Uh, and that considered how project sponsors engage communities of concern in the planning or prioritization process. Uh, and we it spans because you can sort of apply that that engagement process to any any one of these um, categories that fills in, in those criteria. Uh, you'll note that there's more than 24. These add up to more than 24 MPOs. Um, well, that's because MPOs will use multiple kinds of um, uh, categories in their prioritization process. Uh, the most common combination was this location benefits base, so where it was located, and then the potential impacts of those of that project. So for some examples of what these look like uh, in particular, uh, so here this location burdens base. So a project will score 10 points if the proposed project is not located in uh, or adjoining an environmental justice sensitive area. Uh, benefits based if it, if it is there in an EJ area with a high concentration of low income persons or, or minorities. Um, 
the impact space. So this one was specifically based on safety, but there were other examples, as I mentioned, like congestion, um, air quality, uh, and a couple others. Uh, you had access to destination base. So an example of this is the change the number of jobs that uh, low income and minority community workers can access during the peak period. Um, and here, this, this user base is um, looking at uh, percentage of travelers using a facility that are people of color below the, po the poverty line modeled by um, the travel demand model for this is for the Chicago region. Uh, and then the community engagement uh, based was um, that this this engagement strategy was clearly described and includes specific techniques to engage transportation disadvantaged populations. So um, sort of the, the takeaway from, from this part of the work here is that, um, that this trans transparency, if we're thinking about the potential equity impacts of how MPOs or um, any transportation organization is making decisions. We really need to know how they're how they're making decisions. And uh, it wasn't easy to find the prioritization criteria for many of these MPOs. We were only able to get thirty out of the forty, so that's seventy five percent. And these were the largest. So you can imagine that uh, smaller MPOs that don't have uh, as much staff, don't have as many resources, may not be as um, familiar with with us. Uh, um, sort of equity processes as it's a as a it's um, something newer in practice uh, may not be able to to publish this at all. So if you looked at the next uh, the next list, we may not uh, we may get lower than seventy five percent. So uh, if we're thinking about this from an equity perspective, we really want to encourage um, encourage agencies who are using these prioritization metrics to um, to make them clear and to be based on a deliberative process with, with the public, with key stakeholders, um, with experts, with leaders um, to, uh, to make sure that they are sort of advancing equity principles. Um, those location-based measures are limited in their impacts for thinking about uh, equity outcomes. So uh, one challenge is not all disadvantaged groups are spatially concentrated. So certainly in cities we have um, we have uh, issues of segregation and concentration of, of uh, neighborhoods of color and, and poverty. But if you think about other transportation disadvantages, maybe um, access to a vehicle, maybe disability, um, maybe um, single parent headed households, those aren't spatially aggregate. And so it's harder to assess the, the benefits and burdens for them if you're using a, a spatial location as your, as your unit of analysis for assessing equity. Uh, the other thing um, with these location-based measures is that they are assuming that access to the facility provides access to the destinations. And that's not always the case. So if you're building, um, let's say, uh, you know, an improved roadway through a, through a particular neighborhood. Um, let's use a highway project as an example. Most of the traffic is coming from outside of that neighborhood. Uh, and then for those who are in the neighborhood, if you don't have a car, you can't use the facility at all. So that's why we evaluated those um, access to destination impacts as having a greater potential uh, impact for, for equity. Uh, these criteria are weighted in um, among another a uh, uh, whole host of other criteria. So equity is not the only decision uh, that, or not the only criteria that organizations are using to create make decisions about transportation. Nor should it be. But um, what we found was that across the board, these equity rates were generally too low to affect um, any outcomes that were changes in the priorities. That were given to the project. So most of these, uh, most of the scores given were less than than ten percent of the total weight of the of the overall score, uh, and sometimes much less um, in single digit percentages. We did find um, four MPOs that that did weight um, equity higher uh, 
um, up to 25% of the total score were two of the MPOs did that. Uh, and then two had 14% um, of, the, of the total score. But uh, even in those exceptional cases, a, a project that, that doesn't advance equity is still able to rank first by scoring high on other criteria, um, such as mobility and congestion reduction, which is often a, um, an emphasis of transportation planning organizations. Uh, and then lastly, the, these equity measures um, are sort of forward looking. So they say, okay, th this is the status quo, this is how things are, and we're gonna do no more harm from going forward. But when we're thinking about um, real impacts to transportation equity, we wanna think about ways to repair that harm. So as an example, the Reconnecting Communities program does start to say, okay, we divided neighborhoods, let's try to reconnect them. Uh, we didn't find many of these measures that actually went back and, and took a restorative justice uh, approach to it. And so we were recommending uh, an, an emphasis on closing gaps in access um, first, uh, rather than sort of increasing access for everyone uh, in this So um, that's how, that was our look at the region. And so I wanna sort of quickly take a, expand our scope to the states. Um, so we're gonna look at this um, plan development part of the, of the planning process. So um, our central question here was how state departments of transportation are incorporating equity into their plans and programs. Uh, sorry, their, their plans. Um, not necessarily their prioritization um, or their, their program documents. So we did an initial scan of 49 state departments of transportation um, for their long range transportation plans, their active transportation plans. We did look at the, um, their, their tips, the, the project lists, but I actually couldn't find any uh, criteria for how they made them, how they made the lists. So we sort of went back to just the, the plans. And we were looking for whether these, these plans um, prominently featured topics of equity, um, whether they had public participation plans and guidance that incorporated uh, methods for engaging diverse measures of the public, members of the public, uh, whether there were equity metrics used in prioritizing projects in the plans, and then whether um, DOTs had some sort of office of equity to advance equity initiatives. Uh, we're missing one state, we're missing California. The reason was because this project was to help inform what California was doing. So of those 49 states, we found six uh, that had enough to sort of evaluate with respect to equity. So we looked at 16 plans from, from those states, um, Washington, Oregon, Minnesota, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. So for consistency, we reviewed uh, every state's long range transportation plan, and their active transportation plan, or if they had a bicycle and pedestrian plan separately, we looked at those. Um, and as I mentioned, we looked at the, the statewide um, transportation improvement program documents, but we didn't find enough detail in there to analyze them. Uh, we didn't look at things like uh, equal opportunity employment plans or disadvantaged business enterprise plans, because that's sort of a separate category of of work than the, the planning work that, that state DOTs do. So we conducted a content analysis of these, of these plans um, with uh, search terms like the demographic characteristics of, of uh, metrics that they might use in there or um, outreach that they might do, um, things like uh, disparate outcomes uh, and other sort of policies related to um, to equity work. Um, and we did some sort of keyword and context coding and then generated themes from, from them and developed a list of, of uh, themes that I'll show in a moment. And then once we reviewed these plans, we also talked to DOT staff to understand what the challenges were with adopting equity, what the, what the promising practices were and um, needs uh, for uh, better incorporation of equity into um, into their planning processes. All right, so what did we come up with? So the, the three common strategies that um, state DOTs are using to incorporate 
uh, equity principles were goal setting, um, outreach and community engagement, and a little bit of analytical methods and performance metrics, but um, not much as I'll show in a, in a moment. So um, all of the plans that we reviewed for all of the states had some sort of goal for advancing and institutionalizing equity and reducing disparities. Um, so this, uh, this is an example from the Minnesota DOT statewide multimodal transportation plan. And in their, um, in their visioning, they have the advancing equity as a component, uh, emphasizing the need to increase diversity of the transportation industry. So uh, inward looking, uh, as well as uh, inclusive decision-making processes uh, outward, outward looking. We found more of this in um, active transportation plans. Uh, so and specifically, they had more actionable goals and objectives. So the, the statewide, um, the long range transportation plans often had sort of visionary goals and objectives, but we found that the active transportation plans had things like um, uh, demographic data collection as, a, as an objective that they would uh, start conducting, uh, training for staff, um, eliminating disparities, and rebuilding trust uh, for communities. Uh, we also found that um, internal processes were important to institutionalizing equity. That's the word that's that's cut off here. Uh, and we found this from, from the interview. So for example, uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation had recently added an assistant director for social equity, which they viewed as a commitment to institutionalizing equity practices. Um, they had established an advisory committee to a policy advisory committee to inform the, the plan update, um, which had paid spots for members from communities that um, had uh, been done where historic harm had been done to them through transportation planning processes. Um, the Minnesota Department of Transportation was also relatively progressive with um, respect to equity goal setting. Um, although their internal processes were, were still maturing. So they um, had a collaborative effort across all of their offices in the state, uh, in, the, in the DOT, um, to, sort of, to identify the infrastructure available to them internally to, to help um, uh, advance equity in their work. So the leadership, the, uh, the training, the tools, the resources that they, they had available to them. Uh, one example of this embedding equity into their internal processes was, was an update of their plan development guidelines, which was a, a checklist that helped the planning leads in the agency uh, determine what belonged in each of the, the modal and system plans. Uh, and they were revising those guidelines to make sure that equity was uh, present uh, in those guidelines, even though there wasn't a state requirement to do so. Um, in general, through, through all our conversations with the staff at these DOTs, um, they all describe their work as sort of in development. So they're, they're working, they're, they're learning, they're working, uh, and they're trying to get to a place where they can do better. Um, most of the, the long range transportation plans um, highlighted the outreach and engagement efforts with underrepresented population groups as a way to ensure that they reflected a diverse set of uh, voices in the plan making processes. So um, again, uplifting Minnesota um, for some of their uh, innovative practices, they were conducting uh, in-person outreach at community events, at workplaces, um, stakeholder meetings, uh, online outreach using interactive websites, um, online surveys, social media posts. I don't think these are sort of innovative to those who have studied uh, planning because these are these are the tools that planners use, but I think for a state level planning agency, they are innovative in, in what they're doing. Um, the uh, Minnesota also highlighted their their work in uh, in multilingual outreach, uh, meeting with community leaders, um, translating materials into Spanish among um, Somali, uh, which have large presences large presence in uh, Minnesota in general, um, and then uh, targeted um, targeted events and outreach to to members of those communities. <clears throat> 
Um, the, the, the DOT had hired uh, a person uh, in their um, leading their planning efforts who had a background in public health. And so a lot of the community initiatives were modeled on uh, public health initiatives where there's uh, a real emphasis in sort of outreach on the ground work uh, with communities, go to the people approaches uh, to engagement instead of expecting people to come to offices. Uh, and they, um, they also talked about uh, requiring community engagement expertise uh, in some of their contract language with their um, with their contractors who are implementing the plans uh, to make sure that they're not sort of going to a, a check the box kind of uh, kind of process. So this was true for for other DOTs as well. The Washington State um, Department of Transportation uh, conducted outreach to to community based organizations, uh, people of color, immigrant groups, tribal organizations, really trying to encompass the range of diversity in the state. Uh, And um, the contract language was specifically mentioned by the Illinois Department of Transportation to ensure that firms have um, expertise in, in that before uh, attempting to do it. So um, finally, we did find some examples of analytical methods and performance metrics in long range plans, um, but there were fewer examples of these and most of them were not when there were performance metrics, um, they were generally not centered around sort of equity um, focus performance metrics. Um, some that were, were things like um, disability access in the state-owned pedestrian network. So um, I'll show an example of this in, in, a, in a moment. Um, technical scores for improved uh, accessibility for people with disabilities. That was sort of the, the common um, equity metric was a focus on disability and uh, mobility for people with disabilities. Um, but there were some um, there were some scores for positive community impact. So um, one from the Delaware Department of Transportation, their long range transportation plan had um, uh, impact on the public or social uh, impact on the public social disruption or economic justice as a category of impact that was sort of qualitative or subjective, although it awarded points that they valued if they evaluated a certain project to, to lead to um, better economic justice outcomes. Um, they were also, uh, many of these metrics were grouped under um, terms like livability. So um, the Illinois Department of Transportation had um, sort of uh, enhancing existing policies and practices related to underserved populations. Although again, this was uh, difficult to quantify, but it was a metric that they were using to evaluate their, their plan. Um, the number of uh, transportation agencies using performance-based project selection processes was, uh, was an example of sort of an equity focused um, metric. Um, number of multimodal connections in the state, uh, emphasizing underserved populations. Uh, and the, av the availability of non-auto modes for, for underserved populations. So kind of broad and, and general. Um, one, uh, one state, Washington, um, did not have specific performance measures in the plan that we reviewed, but as soon as uh, the report was published, they did, uh, they did publish a list of performance measures and they had a number of equity components uh, in, in them. So as an example of, of some of these um, metrics, and again, the active transportation plans were a little bit more um, uh, sort of innovative with this uh, respect, and there were more advanced applications of, of this tool. So Minnesota developed a statewide index of priority areas for walking. That, uh, that index included the infrastructure supply, um, health-based metrics, health outcomes, uh, land use, safety, uh, and um, equity with respect to the number of younger or older people, disability, uh, people of color, poverty, and a number, a number of other transportation disadvantage indicators. So um, as you can see on the, in the uh, legend here, the darker or the closer to red the color, the more that uh, these were identified as areas of higher need. And um, 
this Minneapolis is Minneapolis is is here, um, but even in predominantly rural areas of the state, you did see areas of, of high need. So they were able to sort of capture this this difference and not just focus on urban areas, but really um, rural areas as well. Uh, so in our conversations with um, with staff, we learned about some of the challenges and opportunities for equity-based performance measures. A big one was data. So um, agencies did not necessarily have consistent definitions of what equity should look like. Uh, and in many cases, we're developing their definitions um, while we were while we were speaking to them. Uh, one, so one goal, for example, uh, for uh, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation was to standardize the process that they were using to evaluate uh, minority and low income populations, which could lead to the application of equity based metrics. Um, they often pointed to their MPO partners as those who were at the forefront of developing these metrics and they were hoping to learn from them. Uh, another challenge was that the data were not always reported at the levels that were needed to um, assess equity needs. So um, Minnesota in particular was, um, talked about how their, um, a lot of their data were reported at the statewide level. So uh, if they wanted to sort of disaggregate by race or income, for example, they could only look statewide and they couldn't look at smaller geographies which meant that they weren't able to really do that, that equity analysis. Uh, and sometimes those racially disaggregate data weren't even available at all. Uh, and finally, we learned that data users were not always familiar uh, with equity analysis. Uh, equity to them meant sort of everybody got, uh, got, got everything um, where it was sort of spread around and, and where it, uh, didn't have the training uh, to be able to sort of think about how to use the models or the tools that they were developing to apply them towards, towards equity. Uh, a huge constraint was, was funding. Um, besides the overall sentiment that agencies never had the, the, sent, the, the ability to fund all the programs that they wanted to, um, some identified constraints on where money could be used. So there were hurdles, for example, in paying participants to um, to to engage in, say, policy um, advisory groups, uh, which is something that uh, those of us who work in research with state agencies are often come up against as well. Um, but one agency did talk about sort of creative ways that they were working to, to fix that, that problem. Uh, some states had legislation that uh, that sort of helped advance their equity work. So Washington had a healthy environment for all act um, which was um, which provided state funding for state agencies to implement recommendations of an environmental justice task force report, uh, and so this meant additional work and funding to to do some uh, additional funding to do equity work. Um, Illinois was um, had uh, passed recently a performance based programming prioritization law, which required them to use performance metrics. And IDOT was evaluating how they were going to incorporate equity into those metrics. Uh, so from this, the, the sort of takeaways that that we um, that we got were that need to develop a definition of transportation equity. Some agencies have one. Some are developing some. One was working in concert with the, with community members to define what that should be, and uh, had a working draft that. Uh, that they spent a year revising to develop that definition. Um, second, that need for performance measures to track and advance equity. So there were already a range of measures that were being used. There is a requirement to track performance measures um, under federal legislation, um, but some of these can be adapted to equity focused measures and metrics. Um, again, uh, that need for transparency in decision making, particularly when we're thinking about how to advance equity in transportation decision making, um, we we highlighted that um, even if quantitative criteria were developed, uh, equity has to be valued highly enough to to make a difference in the way that um, priorities were decided. 
or created. Uh, innovation, we, we saw that some of the most promising practices for advancing equity were novel approaches to the ways that, that DOTs were, were traditionally doing business, like crowdsourcing mapping exercises or creating spaces for experimentation through pilot programs um, where they really could do whatever they wanted and sort of evaluate the effects of that later. And then um, finally, that institutionalization of equity was important to demonstrate that um, equity mattered to, to leadership in the, in the organization. So through creation of um, um, leadership positions, uh, policy that directed the agent agency to incorporate equity, um, and hiring staff and training staff to do this, to do this work. So um, I'll end here and I'll open it up to questions. Ethan, are you ready to moderate? Just set it out there. Respond. <laughs> Both. Yeah, I'll go for it. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, the lack of uh, performance metrics is deliberate. Like, that just gives them more flexibility in the implementing your plan. So, your so um, federal legislation requires tracking of three categories of performance measures: um, safety, congestion management. The third that I'm not recalling off the top of my head. So there are directives to track certain certain measures. And um, in our conversations with some state departments of transportation, they were unwilling to adopt other measures without directives to do so. So that's one one challenge. It wasn't directed to do so. Not forced to do it, they're not going to do it. Right. Um, the other challenge is that, again, as I was trying to emphasize here, equity work is, is new to many departments of transportation. They don't have the expertise in doing it. They don't have the data to be able to, to do it and track it as a performance measure. And so that's another limitation for why this is not more prominent, I think. I think we'll see a little bit more of this equity tracking, particularly with the Justice 40 initiative, which requires 40% of money to go to disadvantaged communities. Um, but when we were conducting this work, we weren't there yet. Uh, Kylie Walznak asked if you could just repeat the question. Uh, oh, yeah. The, camera, the question, yeah, sorry. The question was whether the lack of equity-based performance measures was deliberate. Perfect. Um, we've got one in the meeting chat from uh, Meta Meter Wellborn. She says, uh, or they say, uh, could you speak to how your recommendations aligning with J40's requirements or guidelines? Um, so we, so we did the work, I would say before Justice 40 came about, but I think one of the opportunities is this tracking of, of performance measures. So, um, as 40% of money, federal money is required to go to disadvantaged communities, we need to figure out ways to track, um, whether that money is going to them how much is going and what the impacts are going to be and so um i i would say that's sort of a simple first step on well i say simple because it's easy to say um but i think that's one important step is these these prioritization of tracking the metrics that can help direct agency priorities to to make sure that those investments go to those communities so uh uh, in, in metrics that are evaluated like congestion, yeah. we use tools and data that are of sometimes questionable quality, and, mm -hmm. and they all have their limitations, um, but there are rarely opportunities or incentives to evaluate the success of projects in addressing the things. And I'm curious, sure. within the realm of equity, to what degree we've ever evaluated whether these processes are how well and in what context these processes really deliver uh, the kind of results we think we're going to get? I think we do a good job, again, of tracking where money goes, but we don't do a good job of tracking outcomes. And I think that is true across the board, including for equity. Um, I, there are 
there are probably like I can think of environmental justice related studies that have maybe shown the impact of certain investments or policies like uh, um, the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, for example, has done. They're a CBO, community based organization, uh, that have been involved with uh, basically cleaning up the port uh, at in Oakland and West Oakland, which have the highest concentration of uh, particulate matter in the, in the, I think in the, in the region, if not the state. Uh, and they did some air quality monitoring to show what the, what the impacts, um, what, what the problem was and helped advocate for legislation to, to solve that, to solve that problem. So some of this is being done. Um, a lot of, some of it is being led by community-based organizations. Um, another air quality example in California is there's a um, AB 617, Assembly Bill 617, which directs money to community to community based air quality um, plans. And a, a lot of that um, is in monitoring air quality and um, seeing how investments kind of kind of change that. So that's those are examples of where this has been done. And I, they seem to be most successful when they have community leadership involved in these processes and collaboration with, with state agencies to, to do that kind of work. Uh, Jonathan Crow asks, uh, your research enables us to draw our own conclusions, but can you offer an opinion as to how well you think POCs in general are addressing equity issues? Are the metrics and goals being measured to see how well the problems are being addressed? Well, we only found six, um, seven if, if we included California in that, I think California is, um, I would consider the leader in the nation with respect to adopting equity principles and in their statewide planning. Uh, but we only found six, and of those six, I would say uh, three were pretty high quality, three were okay, two were okay, and one I think didn't have a real understanding of, of what equity was. Uh, so not well, but I think that's changing. Uh, and so this sort of establishes the, the benchmark for you know, where, where we need to go to, to do this at statewide levels. Yeah, there's probably a platform that MPO portion of your presentation is statewide one, but have you like noticed like in like the, the generation of the MPO plans, are there like consultants who have kind of tried to pitch themselves as the like Edgar like Yelp and Igar have like an equity based planning and consulting group that's just these the sort of similarities between these plans potentially? Oh, that's a great question. We didn't look at the authors of, of the plans. Um, I think for large MPOs, there's a mix of in-house and consultants that, that do the work. Um, in my experience with consulting firms, there are some that sort of have equity focuses in the big firms, but also many who contract out with um, firms like uh, the, the Thrivance Group, for example, Destiny Thomas's group that does, um, that does a lot of sort of equity and justice focused um, consulting, but that is a like tracking how this is done over time in the like the consulting world with respect to implementation plans is a good sort of would help sort of understand it. But yeah, I, I didn't look at that too. Yeah, well, yeah, so for the process so how do you think these two can go hand in hand? Or I mean, there is more of a trade off between these two, uh, right? So how do you think uh, these two uh, uh, separate entities can be handled in this process? Also, when you say that uh, most NGOs use ten percent or less women to receive uh, inspiration, uh, Assuming the rest of nine percent is to the cost benefit analysis or some other metric like that, uh, what's the ideal or the optimal value of uh, entity consideration of different uh, categories of products? So I'll answer the second first and second question first. The this the um 
the other 90%, some of it is cost benefit, so economic evaluation. Some of it is specifically related to safety. Um, so reduction of fatalities on roadways, for example, would get some percentage of, of weight. Um, air quality improvement is one. Congestion uh, is, a, is another. Um, the ideal measure, though, is not there's no there's not going to be a universal value for that I don't I don't think I think it depends on the region's equity priorities but it should be enough to sort of change the needle if you have a, a project that's proposed that sort of has some major equity component that's pitted against another project that might not um, but might deliver you know similar benefits with respect to some of the other criteria you should be able to see that move up the ladder. Uh, so enough to make a difference is what I would say. I think um, so. I'm not going to be answer, I'm not going to be able to answer your cost benefit question. Um, I would say specifically, but the a cost benefit analysis doesn't always look at the distribution of those costs and benefits, right? So you can still do a cost benefit analysis by looking at who's receiving those costs and who's receiving those benefits. And I think that's something that if we want to value equity in the decisions that, that agencies are making around transportation, something we need to do more of is understanding where, who's getting the resources, where they're going and who's benefiting from them. Because if we're relying on an aggregate measure of overall benefit, that's that's going to accrue to the same people who have been receiving those benefits as long as we've been doing transportation planning. I see you two over there. We have one more from the chat, though. Uh, Nightmare Bellborn asks, uh, should one be concerned if 40% is enough that goes to for going to disadvantaged communities if there's also historic harm to mitigate? What are some good ways to consider data for historic harm? Uh, well, sure. There, I mean, we could, could we could put all our money into into harm reduction, right? I think that the upper limit is one hundred percent. So, but I but there's political questions and considerations about that too. So, I mean, at forty percent, we'll we'll see what happens. I think it depends on what the investments are are made in and done with. Um, so, data to kind of correct historic harms. One project that I've been involved in is a quantitative analysis of the impacts of freeway construction on communities of, of color and other disadvantaged communities in California. Um, so in this historic analysis, we were looking at um, how many people, so where these highways were constructed, how that related to the demographics of the neighborhoods, who was displaced, by the highway construction and the demographics of people who were displaced. And so we're able to, to understand the scale of the impact at a fine scale way that we really haven't seen in these kind of historical analyses anymore. So that's one example of ways that we could sort of go back and understand what the, the impacts of, of transportation have been. And it's been mostly through, through highway construction. We're at about one now, but we want to keep rolling. Good question. What happened? We have two, I think. And then we can we can move it to the garden. Yeah. So, <laughs> so go ahead. Um, I have a question about the the measures. Yes. Your research has been really helpful to me as I'm putting together a program framework for the city here in Tucson, and I was looking at doing a combination of the location based. But I was wondering also, in addition to that, we're, we're establishing a floor of a percentage of funds that we want to go to these areas of concern. Uh -huh. We're thinking 60%. Um, do you think that is sufficient or is it good? Or what would you recommend as a floor? Um. I mean, it's hard to say in the, the abstract to know like what, how much has been spent in the in the past. So there's some context dependence. Um, I mean, I think if you look at the federal initiative and they've decided the floor is 40%. Um, so anything that's a majority to my mind is, is even better than 
um, it's the, the the other thing to consider, I think, is what those investments, like what that sixty percent is spent on, if it's um, if it's directed on you know two communities that create economic benefits and um, reduce environmental justice impacts and increase access, like those are important things. But if it's spent on, I, I don't know, streetscape beautification projects, maybe that's not the, like the right thing, right? So it really, I, it's hard to say in the abstract what, you know, what is best without knowing. I think what's more important is what the potential impact of those projects and that investment is, is going to be. And uh, related to that, with when you're measuring impact and benefits for users, yeah. have you seen examples of like on these surveys and specific questions where you're able to ask users and assess if, if there are any benefits in their, in their perception? Yeah, um, not in the performance measures that we reviewed. So those user, those like user impacts were um, often modeled or using secondary data sources. So impacts to like safety, they might look at sort of crash reduction, the number of crashes, or if they use air quality um, or, you know, BMT generator, something that isn't specifically user, they're, they're not surveying users because that's hard hard to do at, at the regional scale that, that we were looking at this. But I have seen it in sort of research um, and, and at the city scale that might make more sense in a project. Well, thank you everybody who came today, whether you're online or you're in person, I hope you can move this conversation to the garden for family discussion. And thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks.